God bless you guys. Glad you're here this morning. You know, at Life Streams, we have uh, a mission. And what's our mission? What are we on about here? Helping people find and follow Jesus. <clears throat> That's what we're on about. And uh, really the following Jesus, is uh, it's all about discipleship. It's all, all about our life with Christ, our life walking in step with the Spirit. You know, the purpose of discipleship is always transformation. God is very committed to transforming us to become more Christ-like. And we play a part in that. And any transformation that happens in us is always for the sake of others. Christ died for the sake of others. That's always what we're on about. So in our day and age that we're in, in Perth, Western Australia, or wherever you are online, what does that look like for us? How do we actually follow Jesus? You know, I've been thinking a lot about this over the years. And uh, there's certain words that come to mind. There's probably many more, but one is imitation. Another one is community. I need people around. And another one is practice. Practice. And as we put some of those things into place, it develops spiritual rhythms that becomes more and more a part of the way we live. You know, if we take a baby, um, I've got, uh, my youngest grandchild is, is called Esther, and she's about one and a half now, I think, yeah, around about that. But it, it hits you when you have your own kids, but also when you have grandkids around. How do babies learn how to do things? They imitate. Sometimes they imitate stuff you don't want them to imitate. <laughs> but they imitate you. But then in terms of uh, talking, for example, you sit there, pop, I'm pop. This is my, I'm pop. I figure pop's a good thing. It's the closest to the easiest word they'll ever say. It. And, and Kendall's there, mama, mummy, mum, mum. And finally, after a while, they'll go, pop. And you think, yes, she's got it. Or mummy, oh, well, that's not too bad, but pop's got it. You're right on there. <laughs> and it's the same with walking. How do they walk? They don't just sort of sit there and look at you and think, I want to walk one day. But usually by encouragement and by ongoing, you can even use chocolate, come on, walk. <laughs> no, you're not crawling, walking. You're using little things to help them. But then they start to take little steps and you get so excited, they take a step. And then they're off. And you don't get as excited because they're into things they shouldn't be into. But it's about imitation. It's about encouragement of other people. And it's about practice. Same playing sport. How do you play sport? You, you might have some, gifted, some gifts in sport, some talents, but often you're looking at people and you're watching how they do it. And then you get a coach or people show you how to kick or show you how to throw or shoot. And then you practice. You practice the correct things. Same with music. I'm not a musician. These guys just don't get up here and think, I think I'll give it a shot this morning. They've, they've watched people play and they've got some sort of ability or tenacity and they then start to be taught how to play. And then they practice. And then they're good. Are they good? We're blessed. Thank you guys and girls. It's the same with discipleship. It's about imitating Jesus. It's about doing what Jesus did with other people. It's about using and being with other people in that process. And that can help result in spiritual transformation. 
Now, there's a guy that I listen to a fair bit on podcasts called John Mark Comer. Some of you listen to him, Practicing the Way. If you ever want to get some great stuff, Practicing the Way, John Mark Comer. And he makes the comment that being disciples of Christ involves three things. There's probably many more, but one is being with Jesus. We have to be with Jesus. You know, hang out with Jesus, the abiding with Jesus. Jesus talked about it in John 15. And even when you look at Jesus with his first disciples, Mark chapter 3, it says he called his disciples to what? Be with him. Be with him. Because then they get to look, see who he is, what he's like, how he does things. To be with him. So being a disciple of Christ involves being with Jesus. Being a disciple of Christ is, involves becoming like Jesus. And it then involves doing what Jesus did. It's what he's on about, adopting his lifestyle. You know, we're doing a series in Philippians at the moment. This is living. You can see the, the, uh, the title up there. This is living. And the passage we're looking at today is probably the heart of the book of Philippians. It's Philippians 2, 1 to 11. It's probably the, the central, uh, yeah, the whole center of it. <clears throat> and I think it gives a really clear picture of discipleship of what it is to follow Jesus, of becoming, of being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus and doing what Jesus did. So let's have a read of the first four verses. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, are you encouraged by being united with Christ? I hope so. If any comfort from his love, is that a yes? Yes. If any common sharing in the Spirit, so you see the unity coming through here. If any tenderness and compassion, that's Jesus. Love, tenderness, compassion. And Paul's saying, if you've got any of that, then make my joy complete by being like minded, same mindset as Jesus, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. The unity comes through. Being a disciple of Christ involves unity. It's not an individual thing. We're in this together. Do nothing <clears throat> out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. That's what Jesus did. Nothing out of Selfish ambition or vain conceit, it's always a gift. Gives his life. Humility. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the, to the interests of the others. Once again, the kingdom mindset that Jesus is on about is this for the sake of others. Everything that happens with us is for the sake of others. Everything good anyway. Being like Jesus for the sake of others. You know, discipleship has a shape. You might think, what are you talking about, a shape? It's, it's actually a V-shape. There's a, a descent and there's an ascent. There's a journey to death and there's a journey to life. What are you talking about, David? Let's keep reading in Philippians 2. And we see this shape of discipleship. It's, it's, it's uh, personified in Jesus. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, something to be used to his own advantage. Never for his own advantage, always for the sake of others. Rather, he made himself nothing for our sake. Downward journey here. By taking the very nature of a servant, the king of kings, taking the very nature of a servant, and being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, getting lower here, King of kings, Lord of lords, now in appearance as a man. He humbled himself. 
That's his life. Humility for the sake of others. By becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. The descent pivots at the cross. That's the pivot point. That's the centre point of life. That's the central image is the cross. That's the centre point of history right there. The descent into death by Jesus and by us is that point, the cross. And then we see in verse 9, Therefore, God highly exalted him. We go on the ascent to life. To the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. For our sake. And we're on that journey. You know, this is our Jesus. This is the King of kings and the Lord of lords that we worship. Caesar is not Lord. Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. This is reality. Even though it doesn't seem it all the time. This is reality. Now, when Christ returns, when he reappears, when he appears before us, every knee will bow before him. And every tongue will confess that he is Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, to the glory of God the Father. But today we don't always see that. We don't even always recognise that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But it is reality. So my encouragement is for you to keep speaking out that. Keep declaring it. And we talk about this often, or I do anyway. We keep declaring to the heavenlies that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and is the Lord of lords to the glory of God the Father because that is truth. That is reality in the messy world that we live in. And I really encourage you to not just speak it out but to live in the light of that reality. That's the reality. But the trouble is today, <laughs> we live in a visible world <laughs> A natural world with many, many, many distractions. Many distractions. Discipleship can be tough. Following Jesus can be tough. Come to Christ and die. No, 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 I don't want to do that. I want to live. Hmm. There's a guy in the uh, UK, Pete Hughes. He's got a great church over there. And he, he makes this comment. He said, today especially, and he's talking primarily in Western Christianity, he says, we are more driven by our desires, by our appetites, than by our beliefs and our convictions. It's an interesting statement. We're more driven by our desires. So if we are... Or if we, as disciples, want to become more like Jesus for the sake of others, if we want to do what Jesus did, if we want to more link in with what he's on about, then somehow we have to retrain our desires because they are grabbing you and screaming at you all the time in this very visible world of distractions. We have to retrain our worlds that says... Our, our desire, sorry, that says that if you have a desire, if you have an appetite, then satisfy it. That's what the world yells at us, and that's what our body, our flesh wants, to satisfy the desire, the appetite that we have. So how on earth do we retrain our desires? We can't shut them off. But how do we realign them with what God's on about? This dying to self and rising up to life. Well, one of the key ways that I've experienced, and <clears throat> many of you have as well, is the whole area of spiritual practices. Spiritual practices have got this two types, basically. One is where we abstain from something, we withdraw from something, and the other type is when we engage in something. 
we start something new or we increase something. And I, I believe more and more if we can, and gee, I, I'm just so thrilled, a lot of you are very much on board with this and way ahead of me in many of these. But if we can, if we can work, get this, that if we can retrain our desires by spiritual practices, who knows what God does in and through us? It can be just amazing. Let, let's look at a few of them. <clears throat> and one of the words that comes to mind here is intentional. You know, some of the examples, of, there's a whole pile up there. Fasting is one. I mean, those of you that fast, some of you have fasted for a lot longer than I have. Fasting feels like death. You're hungry. And you want food. And they say, oh, after three or four days it gets better. And I think, three or four days? But you're dying to your need to be driven by your appetite of food. You're saying no to something, dying, so that we grow deeper in our desire for Jesus and our experience of the reality of Jesus. It's a miracle. But fasting is an example. And Jesus talks about it. He says, yeah, when you fast, he didn't say if, so it's an assumed thing, but it's a spiritual practice that enables us to die to self, retrain our desires so that we experience life. In other words, like silence is a spiritual factor. Solitude. We live in a world of noise and crowds. So the, the willingness to abstain or withdraw from noise and crowds for a period of time so that we experience and we can hear Jesus and the Spirit speaking to us may sound foreign to some of you, but it's a reality. But it's a practice. As we practice this, it becomes a rhythm. Sacrifice. You know, there's many, the word sacrifice when we talk about the cross is, it's there, isn't it? Died for the, everyone. That's a sacrifice. But there's many different ways we sacrifice. And some of you, I'm just, as I look around, I just think I'm so blessed by the sacrifice many of you make for the kingdom. You know, one way is, of sacrifice is to give generously. Give generously to mission. Because in some ways you're dying to the need to have lots of money or to have lots more or more stuff. In a world where, where people are often defined by how much we've got. You're dying to that need. You're dying to that desire by being generous. It's, um, it's a beautiful thing. You know, I was thinking of a family who chatted to me, oh, it would have been 12, 18 months ago, and they said, you know, David, we really felt God just laying on us to be more, to up our giving. You know, now generosity goes in a whole pile of different areas. It's not just money. But they just said, we felt God saying, we want you to give more. And they looked at it and they thought, we're barely making budget. You know, got a family and everything. But they, they talked about it, they prayed about it, and they said, right, let's do it. So they started to up their giving, and the first week, guess what happened? The bills got bigger. <laughs> and they thought, oh, gee. But then some miracles started to happen, and they started to experience God in a new way. They died a bit to self, and they experienced God. And, and just recently I've been talking to them, and they said, you know, What's happening in our lives at the moment is just mind-boggling. Both of them in their workplaces have just got people coming to them and saying, how do you live like you live? How do you, do, how do you treat people like that? And they just share the gospel all the time. They've got people coming and saying, will you come and pray for me? Now, they, they're not, I'm not necessarily connecting the dots between generosity back there, and, but may, who knows? They're experiencing life in way new areas. And so sometimes we think we die to self in an area and we think it's going to happen in this way. But God's always got the agenda, hasn't he? He just invites us to be a part of it, to open the space and see what he does. It's a beautiful thing. And it's always about kingdom. It's always about kingdom. 
You know, I think over here on our board, we always have someone there that's connected with our church doing ministry beyond us. You know, Ross is there. Ross, he used to be our missions pastor. He's, he's given up so much for the sake of the kingdom. Right at this moment, he's in Nepal again. I've done a lot of ministry with Ross in Nepal. God bless this guy. You know, he was saved in miraculous ways, in jail. In jail, he was saved by a Gideon Bible. And he thought, no one knows about this. I need to tell people. But he's now doing this stuff. He's based in Sydney, but he's doing this stuff in Nepal for the sake of the kingdom. He's sacrificing much. Think of Dave and uh, Leish Beresford. From our, or Leish is from our church, born and bred in our church. And she's living in the slum. They're living in the slums of Bangkok. So they're not just supporting and ministering there. They're living there. I've been there for one, two days and one night. It's not my cup of tea, let me tell you. Unbelievable. They live there for the sake of the poorest of the poor. Now, we don't compare ourselves, please. And I'm just thankful a lot of you do ministry to the poor. I just love Liz and what they're doing with Raylene. And other. How good is that, eh? And we get to be a part of that through our generosity. But some others are actually using their skills and abilities to minister to the poor. You know, Raylene also does ministry in, in women's prisons. And they're having incredible results there. You know, so you use what you have, but it's, it's the dying to ourself and allowing God to do the life stuff. Put some practices in place. So like Jesus, we go to places where the world is in pain. To weep there, to pray there, to bless people there, to bring God's healing there. And you and I daily are present in those places. It mightn't be as major as living in a slum in Bangkok. But we are in those places with those people every day where the world is in pain. And my encouragement is be Christ to them. And as we are, we humbly bring his love, his humility, his healing and his hope. And God brings life. We die to self for the sake of others. You know, the other spiritual practices are the engaging ones, the ones where we actually we engage. And obviously generosity is engaging and all that sort of stuff, ministry to the poor. But service in general, where you give yourselves and you give your resources for the sake of others, um, you know, a big percentage of you are involved in that in different ways whether it's in our church or outside our church, you're doing it. God bless you. You know, I think of the youth leaders on the youth camp this weekend. You might think, well, they're having a great time. They're having a lot of fun. But every week they put in for these kids. They go through the, the, dis, the discouragement of not seeing much fruit. They're praying. They're reaching out. It's only one example. Time to be in the Word you know, the abiding in Christ, being with Jesus, experiencing God so that the overflow touches people. It's always for the sake of others. We die to self for the sake of others. It's life beyond ourselves. Prayer. You know, prayer is not just a good idea. It's a powerful weapon, powerful weapon in this fight that we're in. We are taking ground that has been stolen by the enemy. There's people who you know and work with and love and live with who are not in Christ and Satan's just got him and he's going in the wrong direction. And you're praying for them and God is at work. That's why we like that song, Don't Stop Praying. <laughs> Don't Stop Praying. It's a, it's, a, it's a spiritual weapon for the sake of others. So maybe for you it's just saying, yeah, I pray. Fantastic. I'm not saying all of these ones are something you've got to pick up tomorrow. We start small in this, but maybe just increase one. Practice this one a little bit more. Prayer. Another one is uh, 
what we've been doing partly this morning, praise, celebration and thanksgiving. You know, they're, they're very powerful weapons, particularly when we do it when life's not running well for us. That's a powerful statement in the heavenlies. When you thank God and you praise God and you celebrate God. It's a e- fantastic thing. By yourself, together with other people, because what it does, and you might think, why is it a dying to self? Because if you're feeling, if you've got some tough stuff going on, and I know a lot of you have, to thank God in the midst of that, that's a death. But what he does is he brings life out of it. We don't always know what the life is going to look like, but he brings life out of it. Oh, I know sometimes it just softens me and it refreshes my spirit. I don't always know what happens beyond that, but I know just what it does here. Uh, confession of sin is another one as well, which it just keeps laying stuff before you, before God, and saying, God, I'm sorry. Don't kill yourself on that one, but just as God reminds you. So these are some of the engagements where we choose to move forward in them. And their spiritual practice, as I said, we die to self so that life is experienced by you and by others. Start small. Take one step. You might think, I'm going to fast. I'll try it for three weeks. No, don't do it for three weeks. All right? Try a meal and pray. See what happens. So as we develop and practice our spiritual practices, it can retrain our desires because we're practicing saying no to things or we're engaging in the other side of things where it's not just about me. See what happens. And the other thing which I find is very helpful in terms of retraining my desires is I'm doing it with people. I'm doing it with you, fellow travellers, a community of fellow travellers. You know, I need to keep hearing stories that Raylene shared. I think, praise God, things are happening. I get encouraged. As we share stories with one another about what God's doing, about some of the steps we're taking and what God's doing out of it, we get excited about it. It encourages us and it goes beyond us. There is no real life without community and there is no real community without humility and love. It's uh, hand in hand. And as I said earlier, that Philippians 2 passage, it's all about unity, humility and love. That's the centre of it. That's what the mindset of Christ is all about. So as we intentionally hang out with Jesus, we're with Jesus, we trust Jesus, even when he's answering our prayers and we're not even sure if he has answered them, we hang out with Jesus, we trust him, we become like him. And as we do more and more what Jesus did, because these are all things Jesus did, as we practice those, as we die to self, more and more we experience the journey to life. God exalts us. God lifts us up. God moves in our life. And God moves in other people's lives through us. You know, one of the things that I was thinking about is, What do we actually experience in terms of the life? It doesn't mean life is always going to work out well for us, but things I notice is I experience more of his love. I experience more of his joy and his peace when I shouldn't get it. I experience more of his hope and, and sometimes strength. That's what he's on about. He's on about giving us all of who what he's on about. You know, this morning you might be here, you're not a Christ follower, you've, you've come this morning with friends, or you've come because you think, I think I need to explore this spiritual thing. I just want you to know that this gift of Christ, the cross, was for you. It was for you. He died for the sake of others, but you need to hear that the sake of others is for your sake. He died for you. So I just pray that you would explore more with people you're with. What does it mean for me to be a Christ follower? We want you to find Jesus today. So I'd love you to take a step towards that. You know, as we think of Paul the Apostle who wrote this book of Philippians, his life was defined by the life of Jesus. 
And I love what he says in the next chapter, which we'll be doing in a few weeks. Verse 10 of chapter 3, he says, I want to know Christ. And you think, surely Paul knew Christ. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection. Yeah, amen to that. And participation in his sufferings. That's how we get there. Becoming like him in his death. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. May we too be more defined by the life and the character of Jesus. Let's pray. So Father, as you've spoken this morning, you've spoken in many different ways to people. Your spirit is speaking right now. I just want to invite you to hear what God is saying to you right now and to respond. Father, again, we thank you for Jesus. And may our prayer be what Paul prays in Philippians 3. Lord, we want to know Christ. We want to know the power of your resurrection. And we want to participate in your sufferings. Father, help us in that. We want to become like you in your death with your humility and tenderness and compassion and love just on show there. We want to be people like you. Father, I pray that we will participate in your sufferings by the spiritual practices we put in place. And so somehow, Lord, help us so that we can attain to the resurrection from the dead. Father, we thank you that everything we do in our following Jesus is for your glory, for the glory of God the Father, and for the sake of others. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.